Let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for that amazing story, our history. Father, we thank you for what you did. And thank you this morning, you're the same God here with us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a story. You can't not read all of that. It's just uh, so full and so rich, and there's so much that could be said. But I just want to go give you a little bit of background. So <clears throat> up to this point, uh, Israel had been sentenced to 40 years of wandering for their unbelief. And now they've come back to the point where they're just about to cross over. And um, this is quite a key event in their history. It's a, it's a moment where they're going to cross over into their history. The crossing of the history was, uh, as it were, uh, absolutely pivotal in what God is going to do next. Just as the Red Sea crossing changed the Israel standing from slavery to freedom, passing through the Jordan into the Promised Land would transform this nation from a wandering horde into an established nation. The Red Sea, as, as to say, it, we see that Christ died for you and for me, and in him we died. But the Jordan what that represents is because he died, we are now able to overcome the sin that will entangle us, that will take us away from God. We no longer have to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. That's the parallel that this story that brings us. The purpose of the Jordan is to emphasize the fullness of Christ. It's a parallel. We've been talking about pictures from the Old Testament that carry over to new. This is a picture thousands of years before Jesus came, of how God would work in us. However, there's a, a barrier that lay in front of these uh, Israelites. They're standing there, and there's a small matter of a, a river to cross. Normally, it wouldn't really present much of a problem, because about 100 for even then, you know, with children, old people, cattle and all that, it's an issue. But normally, it's not such an issue. But, you know, God likes to do things in his own way. It's a little problem, but he makes it bigger. As I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, Simon was saying, is pour on the water. You know, when Elijah was doing the sacrifice, pour on the water, pour on the water. And so the Lord decides to come when it's harvest time, uh, bring the people there. And uh, it says it's in flood, it bursts its banks. And rather than being 100 foot, it's actually 50 times bigger in those days. The Jordan's changed quite significantly now, but in those days, it was 50 times bigger than it would normally be. And it needed something supernatural, something beyond themselves, so no one could boast that we've done this just on our own. That's how God works in our lives. Everything he does, he does, so that none of us can boast. I wonder what kind of Jordans you're facing today. There's things that lie ahead, and it needs a supernatural intervention. It is God's hand to be at working on it. In this, this story, we can learn a lot in terms of how we can uh, come to God in what he did and go out in faith and looking to him. It's been 3,000 years since this event, but God hasn't changed. If you go away with nothing else, remember God has not changed. The same God who helped the Israelites through the Jordan that he, he is today. Just going back to the story a little bit. So in order to overcome this uh, uh, huge obstacle that was in the way, the first thing it needed was uh, what, it, what it involved was a challenge. And this is what it says from verse 3 of Joshua 3. This is Joshua speaking. It says, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. Clive was saying earlier about not knowing what the future holds and which direction to take. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits uh, between you and the ark, do not go near it. So there's three things there, just a short bit. One is watch God, the next is follow God, and the third one is honor God, okay? So, you know, when the ark, which is, I think there's a photo up there somewhere. I, this is one of the images I got online, so maybe not that extravagantly dressed, the people, but I'm sure they were very smartly dressed when they, when they approached that. The next one is a bit of a better image, this is what it's probably more looked like because it had the covering that surrounded the Holy of Holies where the ark was kept. If you want to know more, look back in the first few books of the Old Testament 
and you see the details of that, what the, what the tabernacle was, what the, what the area of the holy place was, where the holy of holies was, where the uh, Ark of the Covenant was kept. It only had three things in it. It had the Ten Commandments on stone that was in there. It also had the manna in there. And it's also had the, there's a bud, there's a, there's a rod that uh, Aaron had, which budded, and uh, just, just spontaneously, uh, and, it, and it represented the presence and the power of God. And that, that uh, essentially a box, which represented God's presence, were to, were to, they were to, uh, when they saw that, they were to, to follow that. You know, when we, when we want God to work in our lives, I don't know what you do. Uh, whether, we, whether we watch out for what God is doing or do we just do our own thing. And I would, I would encourage you in every situation when you want direction, don't just turn to your own experience and your, and your, and your own skills to God in that. The next thing that was to follow God. It says there you, you are to move from your positions when you, when you see the ark. Not only are to watch, watch what God is doing, then you've got to listen. And it would have been no good if, if God had come to Abraham all those years ago and said, go to this place. And you know, Abraham says, great, I've heard from God. You know, it's really good. I'm so excited. And you go around telling people I've heard from God. But he just stayed where he was. We have to move in what God is doing and then do that in faith. You know, for Israel, it wouldn't have been an easy thing. There's a mile long uh, a river to cross you know, you know, Joshua, who was the leader of that nation, nation now, was a humble man, and he learned that from his uh, mentor Moses. He understood he couldn't accomplish anything on his own, not such a task as this. And he didn't do that on his own. He looked to God and sought his will. The third thing that this, these verses tell us is that we are to honor God. You noticed uh, what Joshua says, you're to keep a distance of about 3,000 cubits. Uh, that's about half a mile in modern money. And that's the distance we're to keep. And everyone, everyone was to stay that far. Now, I don't know all the reasons that God said, but a couple of suggestions. One, one is that you know, if there's, a, there's a, a couple of million people following a thing, you know, if, you're, if you're too crowded, no one can probably see it apart from the first few. So keep it now about half a mile, then the crowds behind can actually see it going. And the other, which is probably as significant, is that box a holy thing. It's a holy thing that God had, that God had got uh, made, which represented his presence. And when it was in his position, the Holy of Holies, if anyone but the high priest once a year went in that in the right kind of way, they would be, they'd be killed. Uh, what that tells me is that, you know, when we approach God, we need to approach him with reverence. Let me just tell you, he just, you might be upset by this, but he's not your buddy, okay? He's God in heaven. You know, we have, we have to be in awe of him. You know, we have to see who he is. And you'll, we'll see that a little bit more as we look at the words, of, words that uh, Joshua uses. You know, regardless of how much you know God, how much time you spend with him, He's holy God, and we're to keep that reverence for him in our hearts. And it's something to pray about if we, if we, if we lost that a bit. <clears throat> you know, how do we put all of this in practice? Just a small testimony. When I, when I, some years back, um, as I was seeking God about the future, and especially about a new, new venture, uh, God had put on my heart to go to India at least a couple of times a year. But I didn't want to move just in my own wisdom. So I prayed for two things. I prayed, Lord, would you send someone with me? And I'm not going to ask somebody. Please send somebody with me. And also, I don't want to pay. I want to go free. So I started to pray. I started to pray. And just within a few weeks, a friend of mine who sort of went every now and then, I was actually praying he'd be the one that I'll go with. He said, oh, called him. You, you fancy going to India? I said, oh, I do. And he said, okay. Uh, I'll get my dad to arrange the ticket. I said, okay. He wasn't saying he was going to pay for it. I said, I'll get my dad to arrange it. I said, all right. So the first thing that happened, and then I just, that encouraged me to trust the Lord for the second one. And as I waited, it was just several months ahead that I was due to go. Again, I've never asked anyone for money, uh, unless it's a tenor of Clive, and then I don't pay it back or something. But uh, uh, is, is that um, 
some three individuals just gave me money, and on I didn't know what the price was going to be. That three, those three tickets amounted to exactly the money that was charged for that ticket. So I was really quite confident God is with me in it, and he led me in, and used that time, and I've been going ever since, uh, except during COVID, every couple of years. So that was, it involved a challenge. They were to look for God, they were to follow God, they were to reverence God. The next thing that involved was a command. Joshua says to them in, in the next verse, he says, to, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Uh, who here this morning wants God to do amazing things in their lives? <laughs> don't have to put your hands up. Put your hands up if, if you don't. No, no, no. You want, you know, we want God always to do amazing things. If you want that, this is, this is the next thing that God says. Sanctify yourselves. Now, what does that mean? It's another word for holiness. You know, we've been singing holy, holy, holy. Our God is holy. He's different, isn't he? You know, they, they, we just cannot imagine how beautiful he is, how loving he is, how kind. And it's just totally beyond our imagination. But we see, we see everything that God was in Jesus. All that Jesus was, he was. And God wants us to be like that. And he's saying to these people, not that they're going to achieve it by tomorrow, for them, all that meant was having a bath and putting on washed clothes and being ready for the next day uh, and uh, abstaining from uh, sexual relationships. That's what that, that meant to them in those days. But what this means is to be set apart and it, it carries this meaning of leave sin behind, not just that, but also then to be set apart to serve God. We want to go God's way. To be sanctified is to be set apart for God's purpose. If you want to see amazing things tomorrow, sanctify yourselves today. And this is, this is what a, a great man of God in the past said about, about his life. There's a day when I died. And as he, this is what, this is a description that somebody watched as he spoke about this. As he spoke, he bent lower until almost touched the floor. Continuing, he added, die to George Muller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will die to the world, its approval or censor, die to the approval or blame, even from my brethren or friends. And since I have studied only to show myself approved to God, that's what we want. That's what it means to be set apart. We don't, doesn't matter what other people think of us, but what we want is what God thinks of us. We want to set ourselves apart. You know, if they, if they were to expect to pass the Jordan, they had to set themselves apart and follow what, what God was asking of, the, of them. Now, this morning, you may think, well, I don't even know this God. What does all that mean? To be sanctified in that sense is to repent to the things you've done. And everyone in this room, including myself, we've done much wrong and sadly continue to do wrong. We just can't help it. But there's God out there who wants to forgive us. He's a holy God. And through Jesus, he's able to do that. If you've never done that, you know, please come and see me afterwards and I will pray with you. I'll be delighted for you to, uh, to pray with you and ask for the Lord to forgive you and come into your lives. For those of us that are believers, it means that we need to pursue him, to set apart God as our target and only aim. Remember, no matter what situation, there's forgiveness in confessing our sins to the Lord. So it involved a challenge, it involved a, it involved a message. Verses 9 through down to 13, it says this, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hevites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. There were seven big and powerful nations ahead. Since I uh, see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your Lord of all the earth, I've turned something on here. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set the foot 
set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Uh, incredible words in just those, in there's so much in there, just some things to notice for us. Joshua, even though he was the leader, he didn't come up and say, listen to what I'm saying. He said, listen to what God is saying here. God had promised that as soon as, soon as uh, the, the Levites begin to walk, this is what's going to happen. Uh, God, God had already said to him, I'm going to lift you up in the presence of these people today. I'm going to make you, make you uh, uh, have higher esteem like Moses had, and people are not going to look at you again after today. But he wasn't worried about that. And he says, come listen to the words the Lord your God is saying. And this word is amazing. It says, this is how will you, know, you will know that the living God is among you. How do we know this morning the living God is among us? You know, we, we live in an area where many false gods are worshipped. You know, people out there worshipping statues. They have eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear, mouths that can't speak, feet that can't walk. In fact, they need to be carried. You know, we have a living God. The living God was with them. The living God was with them, and he was among them. He will not fail you, Joshua said. He will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites. You know, what an encouragement. They're going to do an amazing thing. Things are going to happen. There's challenges that lie ahead. There's so much that God is going to do. But he's saying, I'm going to do it. I'm the living God. And he uses his words in there. He says, the Lord of all the earth. You know, that's the God that we worship. That's the holy God that we worship. He's the Lord of all the earth. Not just that tiny little bit. The whole earth. His plan was to get them over. And it was his problem, is what he's saying. You know, for us, uh, whatever plans God has, and if we're walking in them, and walking with him in them, it's his problems, problem to help us through that. All, we, all that's required of Israel then and for us today is to trust him, to trust him in that. God hasn't changed. He's not changed. And this message is one that we should take to heart. Whatever he's promised, he will do. And without him, we can do nothing. You know, we often talk about this building, and you know, this, this actually passage reminds you that we've got to remember things that God has done. 2017, we got the building finally. But, you know, we started praying on the 23rd of November 2009. It took, it took eight years. We prayed. Clive played every day. I prayed sometimes in the week. Yeah? Yeah? But I would park out there and I'd say, Lord, how on earth are we going to do this place up? So I used to pick Vashi up from her work. She'd say, how on earth are we going to get this done? Where will all the money come from? We used to pray that, Lord, how are you going to do it? And then, although I was confident God was going to do it, there were doubts would creep in. And one day I was walking out through the back door, uh, through the back entrance of the old building, and the Lord did something in me, and there was like a, such an assurance that something had changed that in, in me, for me. God did something. And another thing that really helped me, if he, if he sat back there, uh, 2015, through the cafe, Don got saved. And that also really firmed up something in my heart. God put a marker down that day for me. And uh, God does things, you know, as we follow him. And, and in the journey that we have, God does things, and he will not let us down. But we need to trust him as we walk with him. The next thing, it would take a miracle. It took a miracle. Verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead. Now the Jordan is, is, in, is at flood now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap at a great distance away in a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathen, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Araba, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests carried the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord uh, stopped in the middle of the Jordan, 
and stood on dry ground while all the Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Uh, I, I wish I could have seen that. You know, it was, it was about 20 miles down the road from where they were crossing. But imagine a pile of water just, 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 just collecting. Uh, you know, while I was looking and studying this, there have been some natural phenomena that have made that done. That God could have used that similar thing. There's some, the latest one was in 20, uh, 1927. An earthquake made it happen. And, that, and that, that's, that flow of water lasted 21 hours. I don't know what God did, how he did it, but he did it. But you know, when you, when you read the Bible and you believe it, then nothing is impossible to our God. He's the God of the whole earth. Verse 1 tells you made the heavens and the earth. So what is a little stream? What is a river? Nicola just gone, just touched it. That's it. Just stop. That's our God. That's the God that we worship. 20 miles up, plenty of space for a couple of million people to pass by and however long it took. You know, the only thing I feel sorry for is those Levites. They were holding that ark. It, it wasn't as big as the first photos. It's still a heavy object. I don't know where they had shifts, where the different lifts came in. I just started to picture how they would have done that. Held that box in that position while all those people, people passed by. But anyway, coming back to the story, it was going to take a miracle. And a very, very basic ingredient we need for a miracle in our lives is obedience. You know what we see in this bit of reading? The people were obedient. They followed what Joshua had said. The priests were obedient. They were the ones that were going to go ahead. They're the ones that had to put their foot in that water. You know, in the last, when Jesus, or when Moses divided the sea, he just had to put a rod in it. Now they were going to put a foot in it. So it was something different they had to do, but they were obedient. And, and so to speak, God was obedient to his own word. As soon as the soles of the feet dipped in the water, God stopped the flow. And the priests stood on dry ground and their water just stopped there and it piled up. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? When you think of that picture, you know, it, it, it may be right now that you're facing some insurmountable problem. You know, what, so what we're trying to say here, you know, we have this, the same, same God is here today who is able to overcome your problem to help those Israelites to cross over. Um, doubt and disobedience and, dis and disunity delays things. You know, the Israelites have suffered. For 40 years there was a delay because there was, there was, there was no faith in those people and they had all now died. You know, the 10 spies had gone out and they came back with, well, 12 spies had gone out, but 10 came back with bad reports and it troubled the whole nation. You know, when a problem faces us, we forget God. That's the first thing. I do that as well. First time, how am I going to get around that? But actually, we've got to come to our senses and remind ourselves, God is with us. He's in us and he wants us to get through that problem. You know, where God, when we see the problem and we say there's no way, God looks at it and he says, follow me. I have a plan. I have a plan. And it always takes a step of faith to see a miracle. You have to step into that water to, do, to see what God is going to do. Remember that faith honours God and God honours faith. God, who did great things among the Israelites, is the same God today. Very, very briefly, lastly, just dipping into chapter 4, verses 8 uh, through to 9, just read that first. Joshua 4, 8 to 9. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had commanded Joshua and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood and they are there till this day so there's it needed a memorial it needed two memorials God had only asked Joshua to get the people to do one and I'm not sure why he did it but he decided to do two one was to take 12 stones out you know you know when you see memorials around in places they're quite grand aren't they 
Look around the world, what memorials people have built. God just says, get up some rocks. Bring those out. No, it's not the memorial that counts. It's what it represents. They would take those stones out. And uh, what that meant to them, I'll just go through that in a moment. But the first thing, the other thing is, Joshua also, just um, it seems like because of his own accord, he goes into the Jordan, and it looks like he did it himself. He put a memorial there himself. He was one of the two that had gone into the promised land 40 years earlier. Maybe he's about 60 plus now, maybe 60, 70 years old, something like that. But he'd seen that. Maybe he's saying, the, old, the past is now buried. It's gone. You know, Thank God that is over. Now we're going into the new. Maybe, well, I, I don't know, but he did that uh, of, him, of his own volition. And this is what it says a little bit further down, verse 21, as to why God had wanted the other one. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before you until you'd crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. You know, this morning, as we were praying before the meeting, someone just prayed, Lord, help us to write new stories. You know, this is a story that is, as I said, 3,000 years old. We're reading it today. We're learning from it. But there's stories in this room. You know, what are there things that you can look back on and see what God has done? We're to share those stories. We're to talk about, not, not because you're so great, but it's because our God is so great. Our God is good. He's done things in our lives individually. We have a story together over 40 years this year in what God has done. And we're to share that. We're to be proud, not, not of ourselves, but we're proud of our God. He's to be honoured. He's not changed. And especially those stories that we told our children. You know, God has blessed us with so many kids in recent years. If you don't tell them what God has done for you in your life, how will they ever learn? Parents, do you get ready if you're really too young? If they're older, talk about it. You know, there's so much encouragement and instruction uh, in, in, your, in, in the books of Moses about telling your kids, telling your kids. It's our job to do that. You know, this morning, as we finish, there may be some Jordan that you're facing, some huge problem that you just don't know what to do with. It may be just thoughts about the year ahead, as Clive was saying earlier. I want to commit that to God. You know which way to go. But we know a God who has good plans for your lives, which he created when? Before the world was made, before the Jordan was made, before we were specking our mum and dad's eyes, or whatever you want to call it, or a speck or whatever that is, um, you know, whatever twinkle, um, whatever it was, God had plans for you. There's things that he's made just for you to do, and no one else can do them like you he wants us to find those out. You know, maybe you need prayer. There's be a prayer team in a moment. Do come forward. But just this promise from Isaiah as well. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Our God is good. He will keep us through no matter what trouble and he'll help us through. Let's just pray. Father, thank you this morning. Lord, you're good. Lord, you haven't changed. You're a God of miracles. But when we cooperate in unity, when we are obedient to your word, Lord, you do things that we just cannot imagine. Father, thank you for the history you've given us as a church. Lord, what a thing that you've done. We give glory to you this morning. And Lord, as we look forward, Lord, whatever holds, whatever's ahead, we walk with you, Lord. We're not afraid because you're with us, Lord. Father, when we see challenges, Father, thank you that you have a plan. Lord, help us not to have our own plans, but things that require miracles, things that require things that we just cannot manage on our own. Lord, we just pray this morning that ours will be on you. 
We will look for God, that we will follow him. We will honor you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Go for prayer later on if you need it.